And indeed, the next item of business is a debate on motion 17091 in the name of Liz Smith on subject choice. And I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Liz Smith to speak to and move the motion for up to 13 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I open this debate by moving the motion in my name and by reiterating our belief on these benches that Scottish education should be based on excellence and equity and that it can once again lead the world when delivering the highest standards. That, however, will not happen until the Scottish Government changes its focus. Scottish education was so admired around the world because there was this universal understanding that good schooling was the key which could unlock so many different opportunities in life, never mind in employment. There was an expectation, irrespective of your class or background or whatever type of school you attended, that everyone would have a good grounding in the basic skills and that poor standards would never be tolerated. Teaching was a very highly valued profession, leadership was generally strong, and good schools were seen as the central component in building strong communities. In short, many schools in Scotland were synonymous with excellence, and they did not need endless edicts from local or central government telling them what to do because aspiration was ingrained in the DNA of their schools. The Scottish Government knows that it can no longer make that claim of all-round excellence. This Parliament has spoken many times about the evidence which demonstrates that we should be doing a whole lot better if we are to match up to our full potential, just as the OECD identified in its last report into Scottish schools. And it is our contention that we will not be able to unlock that full potential, which is undoubtedly there, until we address the fundamental weaknesses in the delivery of the Curriculum for Excellence for which the question of subject choice has become one of the most significant and pressing issues, and one which is obviously causing considerable worry to parents, teachers and young people, and of course to the Education Committee of this Parliament. Of course, one of the other great attributes of Scottish education was the breadth of the curriculum, maintained not just in early secondary schooling, but in later secondary schooling too. Indeed, that breadth, whereby young people could acquire national qualifications, with a balanced group of science, social science and languages, as well as in the English and maths, was seen as superior to the A-level system in England and to, to several other curricular systems elsewhere. At its inception 15 years ago, the intention of the Curriculum for Excellence was to build on that success, but also rightly to recognise that in the modern world, society would require a greater focus on skills and on personal and social responsibility than had been the case in the past. In other words, education should not solely be about the knowledge-based learning in the abstract, but also about how it is applied. Young people should understand why they are learning something just as much as what they are learning. And as such, one of the intentions of the Curriculum for Excellence was to actually widen subject choice, not reduce it. And in 2008, the Scottish Government's curriculum guidance made that principle abundantly clear. Presiding officer, no one could disagree with the fact that young people should understand why they are learning something and learning additional skills. But the trouble is that the curriculum has completely lost its balance. As Professor Lindsay Patterson said in a recent article in the Sunday Times, the focus on core knowledge has been diminished. Our hard pressed teachers have been so busy measuring experiences and outcomes and wading through thousands of bits of paper issued by the education agencies that they have had less time to get on with teaching which, with what most people recognise as the core curriculum. So let me turn to the details of what has happened in the context of subject choice, the facts of which have been increasingly clear over the last two years and which are currently before the Education Committee. Although can I make the point here that the concerns about the narrowing of subject choice were raised by Aberdeenshire schools as far back as 2013 and again in this Parliament by the Conservatives in 2015. This Parliament knows that it was the norm for Scottish schools to offer six subjects in S4 and that the subject choice column structure in the vast majority of schools was designed to do just that. Now, thanks largely to the work of Professor Jim Scott, we know that the majority of schools in Scotland are offering over only six subjects in S4. These schools will undoubtedly also be offering other courses, many of which have a very good pupil uptake and are very educationally beneficial. But the fact remains 
that they are offering fewer core subject choices than they were before, and I will address the impact of that in just a minute. John Swinney. I'm grateful to Liz Smith for giving way. Does she not understand the inherent contradiction in the remark that she's just made, where she has welcomed the fact that there are other curriculum choices and offerings available to, to pupils within schools, and at the same time as welcoming that, has bemoaned the fact that that has led to a reduction in one particular year of S4 in the range of subjects that young people are ordinarily choosing, when in fact more young people are now staying on at school for longer and therefore have the opportunity to undertake further courses. Liz Smith. No contradiction whatsoever, Cabinet Secretary, because the, the critical issue here, as we were reminded this morning, it is not about the numbers. This is about the qualitative effect on, on the subject choice that young people are able to make. And the real concern which this Parliament is seeing just now is that there has been a, a diminution of the core subjects that not only do they want to take, but they need to take, and that Scotland needs to take for economic benefit. That's the key point, Cabinet Secretary. But there's another fundamental point here, and that is the growing inequity across the country. We know that 32% of schools are still managing to offer seven subjects, and 11% of schools are still offering eight subjects, as well as those schools in the independent sector. And we know too that there is important evidence which points to the fact that young people who are at schools in more disadvantaged communities are generally likely to be offered fewer subjects than those in the more affluent areas. In evidence to the Scottish Parliament, the Royal Society of Edinburgh said that schools have undoubtedly, undoubtedly, cut the number of subjects that pupils can sit, and this has hurt the pupils from the most deprived communities the most. Marina Shapira of Stirling University said that the finding had been striking, namely that there was a clear relationship in the reduction in the number of subjects studied by S4 pupils and the level of school area deprivation. And she was very clear about the subsequent disadvantage to those in those schools, something which parents believe can affect negatively on the employability of some of their young people. Now, Cabinet Secretary, it is unacceptable that there is this inequity because it fundamentally undermines one of the key strengths of Scottish education. And if the Cabinet Secretary looks very carefully at the transcript of the Education Committee reports, he will see that the committee members, Labour, Liberal, Green, Conservative, and the SNP are unanimous in our concerns on that point. But there is another point here as well. The curriculum for excellence was also meant to provide greater autonomy for schools as they approach the curriculum development. Yet in many local authorities across Scotland, it is the local authority that appears to have taken the one-size-fits-all decision about how many subjects are offered. And I'm sure not, I'm not the only member in the chamber to have received communications from parents asking me where the fairness lies in schools in one local authority, which has a blanket approach to only six subjects, while in S4, in some neighbouring local authorities, that is not the case. Would yes, I would. John Mason. I, I thank the member for giving way. I'm slightly puzzled. She seems to be arguing on the one hand for more consistency on the national level and yet for more autonomy for the individual schools. Can she explain how these two tie together? Liz Smith. Uh, yes, I can, because the fundamental principles of the curriculum for excellence have not allowed these two to match up. We, we do need consistency. Of course we do. And we need core curricular uh, subjects in every school. I think we're all agreed on that, and that's certainly all the evidence that's coming back from the Scottish Parliament. But as things stand just now, the curriculum for excellence and the principles that it's supposed to enshrine does not allow for that to happen. And that what is a, a major concern as far as we are concerned. Uh, yes, I will. John Swinney. I, th I think this is, this is a fundamental point, which I, I don't understand about the Conservatives' position here, because I actually agree with the Conservatives about schools having much more discretion over curricular choice. Indeed, that is one of the fundamental elements of the head teacher's charter that I am currently implementing within Scotland. So I agree with that point about school empowerment, but I don't then understand how Liz Smith can complain about the products of school empowerment if, though, if that leads to schools taking different decisions, one school compared to another. I can allow you a little extra time, Ms Smith. Liz Smith. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, can I just give you the example that uh, Larry, Flanag um, sorry, Larry Flanagan gave us, Lanagan gave us 
uh, from ADES at the time, where he argued, uh, I think it was Tavish Scott who made the point, that in some schools, uh, was it possible for youngsters to take the three sciences? And he said, yes, of course, it's possible for them to take the three sciences. But in a school that is only permitting uh, the six subject choice option, if you are taking the three sciences, uh, you're taking physics, chemistry, and uh, biology, plus English and maths, but you only have one other subject that you can take. Where is the breadth, Cabinet Secretary, in that? That is one of the real, that is one of the serious problems about curriculum for excellence. No, sorry, I think I've uh, taken uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, interventions. Presiding officer, I, I think this is a, a very significant uh, issue about the traditional value and ethos of the Scottish curriculum, namely a strong balance between science, social sciences and languages, and one which maintains a really strong breadth at higher. And if the Cabinet Secretary needs any more evidence, perhaps he could have a look at what's happened to the uptake of uh, modern languages. Perhaps he could have a look at some of the issues about STEM subjects, because it's these issues that many of the people who are giving evidence to this uh, Parliament are complaining about. Of course, it also tells us that there has been a huge imbalance between the broad general education, I think the name tells us something, and the senior phase. And I think it was Jenny Gilruth who rightly argued last week that young people actually have more subjects to study in the early years of secondary education because of the 3 plus 3 model, as opposed to the 2 plus 2 uh, plus 2 model. I agree. <coughs> but the huge problem is that they suddenly find themselves that they've got to drop down to six subjects in S4. Something which incidentally has a knock-on effect of the timing of the subject choice that they make. So what we are saying to you, Cabinet Secretary, is that the effective choice, the effective choice, which has always underpinned the so-called gold standard of hires and advanced hires, is now being constrained. There is clear evidence that points to that, Cabinet Secretary, and that is what is the major concern for this Parliament. May I finish, Cabinet Secretary, on where I think we have to deal with three very specific things. And the first is a very strong suggestion made by Dr. Alan Britton, who argued that there is confusion around the curriculum for excellence, and it remains unclear about who takes ownership of the curriculum in Scotland. This ties in with the point that's often made about gen general, broad general education. It was designed by Education Scotland. In the senior phase, however, it has been SQA. There is a disconnect somewhere along the line and Cabinet Secretary, I think we are all agreed that we have to do something about that. Secondly, there has to be a debate about what the core curriculum should offer in schools. If we look abroad to what schools are asked to do, there is a desire to ensure that there is a strong balance between knowledge-based learning and skills development, with the former seen as extremely important so that young people can make a fully informed choice. And thirdly, it must relate to the question of teacher numbers because there is, we are very clear that the squeeze is having a detrimental effect on the number of subjects because the number of teachers has been squeezed and the availability of certain teachers in certain subjects is not as good as it should be. Presiding officer, education is many things. It's the foundation on which we base our hopes and ambitions for our children as well as something that touches our deepest emotions. It is the prerequisite for economic wealth, the guardian of our culture, the vehicle by which we learn about our rights and responsibilities, and it is the key with which we can unlock so many doors to the wider world. It is also supposed to be the SNP's top priority. How often have we heard in speeches or in programmes for government that excellence and equity are the two principles underpinning Scottish education? How we wish that in practice they were. Presiding officer, education is the most precious gift that we give to our young people. But for far too many of them, the current system of schooling in SNP Scotland is letting them down. The Scottish Conservatives believe that things could and should be so much better that, so that Scotland can once again lead the world. I now call John Swinney to speak to and move Amendment 1709 1.4. For eight minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the purpose of Curriculum for Excellence is to provide young people with the skills, knowledge and experiences that will prepare them for life beyond school and enable them to fulfil their potential. We must support our young people to flourish in our modern, complex, uncertain world. 
curriculum for excellence was introduced after a major national debate on the aims and the future of our education system. It represented a deliberate move away from an approach which prescribed the content of the curriculum to one which emphasises both the autonomy of the professional teacher and the capacities and the learning experiences of the learner. In short, CFE was predicated on the view that our teachers are best placed to know their learners and work with partners to meet their needs and aspirations. They must have the flexibility to make the correct judgments about the journey of a young person. Given all of this, I'm surprised that the debate has solely focused on the counting of the qualifications taken and particularly in the narrow focus on S4 within the three-year senior phase. Instead of looking at the bigger picture of what we are trying to achieve, and in my view, in many cases, succeeding in achieving, what is implied is that the, system, the new system is providing our young people with fewer opportunities. I simply do not recognise that, of course. Liz Smith. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Cabinet Secretary, it is not all about numbers. It is about the nature of the choice that they are afforded. That's the key point. Cabinet Secretary. Well, it, it, to, to, to be absolutely technically correct, there is a relationship between the numbers and the choices. Of course there must be. But what I'm, well, the point I'm about to come on to is about the question of breadth, which was, uh, I think, due justice to this point, was not given in Liz Smith's speech a moment ago. When I wrote to the Education Committee convener in October last year, I was clear that any comparisons between the current and previous system needs to take into account the fundamental differences between curriculum design before and after the introduction of Curriculum for Excellence. Under the broad general education, and Liz Smith did not refer to this point, young people are entitled to study a wide range of subjects to a much deeper level across the eight curricular areas without the pressure of taking qualifications. This broad experience extending into S3, not S2, is one of the key differences which ensures that breadth is not lost. In the senior phase, young people have the opportunity to acquire a range of qualifications and awards over a three-year period, not a one-year period in S4. Uh, of course. Oliver Mundell. I understand the point the Cabinet Secretary is trying to make, but does he not recognise that if pupils drop subjects in S4, particularly modern languages and STEM subjects, that it's very difficult then to pick them up in S5 and almost impossible to pick them up again at advanced higher? Cabinet no, Secretary. Uh, no, I don't, I don't accept that experience because that suggests that when a young person leaves the broad general education, they dispense with everything and any bit of knowledge and skill that they have acquired in that process, and that is a ridiculous argument to advance. The guiding principle is that qualifications are taken at the appropriate stage for the individual young person over the three years of the senior phase. This represents an intended fundamental shift from the pre-CFE era. In the national debate in 2002, which preceded the development of CFE, it was accepted that because there was too much assessment, there was too little equipping young people to handle a range of challenges in life. The intention was to create a system which gave the flexibility for schools to design approaches which reflect the needs of schools and young people. The OECD recommended that change should be driven from the profession itself rather than from the political centre. And that is, for me, a fundamental issue in this debate. The curriculum models that have been developed have been developed by the teaching profession in consultation with educational professionals around the country. This was a further emphasis on the autonomy of the teacher, which I fully support and which is central to the government's empowerment agenda, which is intended to foster collaboration and to create dynamic and innovative curriculum approaches. If Elizabeth will forgive me, I've, I've got quite a lot of ground to cover. Focusing on numbers of qualifications taken in S4 simply does not recognise that CFE enables our young people to achieve higher levels of knowledge and experience across a broader range of subjects by the end of S3, or that more and more young people stay at school beyond S4 and beyond S5. S4 used to be the end of a phase of learning, with the aim of accumulating as many standard grades as possible, with many learners then opting out of school. That is no longer how young people interact with our education system. They stay at school longer. They engage in school college partnerships. They take forward opportunities through the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce Agenda. They take forward a range of national progression awards. For all of these reasons, a comparison between the number of standard grades young people sat in S4 in the past and the current circumstances in Scottish education is, in my view, misplaced. 
Surely the comparison that matters is what young people achieve on exit from school. For example, last year, 62.2% of school leavers left with a qualification at level six or better. That's gone up from 55.8% in 2012, uh, 13. And what, uh, if Mr. Mundell would forgive me, I've still got some detail to cover. And work-based provision for young people in the senior phase is growing. The proportion of school leavers attaining vocational qualifications at SCQF level five and above has increased from 7.3% in 2013-14 to 14.8% in 1718. 61,000 SQA skills-based qualifications, awards and certificates were achieved in 2018, up from 47,000 in 2014. And perhaps above all else, we should celebrate the outcomes that are achieved by the education system. Last year, a record proportion of school leavers went on to positive destinations, including work, training, or further study. Presenting officer, CFE was designed as a... Uh, of course, yes. Joanne Lamont. This slightly separate point, but would the Cabinet Secretary confirm that he's going to do an analysis of what those positive destinations are? Because far too often, it's insecure work, zero hours contracts, and no guarantee of any training. I'm Cabinet Secretary. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to explore the substance of that, but what I think we should recognise is the fact that young people are leaving school with more qualifications and going on to better destinations. President Officer, I recognise the importance of this debate and the need for us to consider a broad range of evidence in that process. But I am perplexed about why we're having the debate today. Yep. The Education and Skills Committee has embarked on an inquiry on this topic and it's held only three evidence sessions. Some of the evidence the Education Committee has heard already is highly disputed. It has not heard from professional associations uh, and disputed by ac other academics. But no, disputed by other academics. Not just the ones that the committee's heard from and not by me, not just by me, but by other academics. It's not heard from professional associations or the chief officers of education at local level. Uh, I will do, yeah. Oh, I'll have to be brief, Cabinet Secretary. You've only got a minute more. Yes. I will be very brief. Would the Cabinet Secretary accept that if we spent more time debating education on government time, perhaps this issue that has been in the public spotlight for years now might have already been covered? Cabinet Secretary. What I, what I, what I, what I can't understand is why we have an education committee process that is underway that is supposed to be taking in excess of 20 hours to consider balanced evidence because we need to have an evidence debate on the subject. But today, we're being asked, today we're being asked in 160 minutes to debate something that the Education Committee has planned to take at least 20 hours to explore in the detail of its own proceedings. The motion today offers no evidence and no solutions. Subjects are already chosen for the next year, so we could have waited until the Education Committee deliberated in June and then formed our considered opinion about how to move forward. It, sub, subject to what I hear later today, I intend to ask the government to support the Labour amendment because I think they make a reasonable point. And I consider the amendment that I'm moving today, presiding officer, is equally reasonable. It doesn't try to dodge the debate. It just asks that we carry... Well, well, it doesn't. It doesn't. It just encourages us to look at this in an evidence fashion and conclude what to do next for the simple reason that that's what the people of Scotland would expect our Parliament to do, to listen to the evidence and come to the conclusion and not have a debate anchored on the principle of political opportunism for the Conservatives, which is what we've got today. So, please, so, no, no, I'll say it, I'll say it for the benefit of Sir Edward Mountain, I'll tell him again, political opportunism of the Conservative Cabinet Party. Cabinet Secretary. I move the motion <laughs> I'm in losing my, my voice, yes. Uh, can I just say to members, particularly if you drum your desks, I couldn't hear what Ross Greer actually said. If I can't hear it, the official report can't hear it. So please don't keep that habit going. I understand passion, but don't drum the desk so loudly. Can't hear what people are saying. I now call on Ian Gray to speak... <laughs> I now call on Ian Gray to speak to move amendment 17091.2, Mr Gray. Thank you, President Officer. It's quite usual with these opposition debates for all sides 
uh, to start by acknowledging the importance of the debate, even if they're about to disagree with the substance of the motion. Uh, the government are taking a rather different approach today, though, as we've just heard, with an amendment which says, in essence, that we should not be debating subject choice in our schools at all, at least today. I, I, I hear the argument, I hear the argument that they are simply respecting the work of the Education Committee and our inquiry into the topic, which is ongoing, moved, no doubt, by their profound principles of due parliamentary process and balance. <laughs> but I'm afraid I, I don't buy that for the very good reason that Parliament has been asking them to take this issue seriously for four years now. Some of us have been talking about this for a lot longer than 160 minutes, that's for sure. It was back in May 2015 that Kezia Dugdale raised Dr Scott's analysis shown a fall in both enrolment and attainment in the new national exams. And I uh, myself elaborated Dr Scott's work in a Labour business debate that month. Ms Dugdale raised it again with the First Minister in early June that year. Now the government's response then was to deny there was a problem, to rubbish the research, even to suggest that Dr Scott, a respected educationalist and former head teacher of several schools, didn't really understand schools or exam statistics. Well, here we are four years on, and Dr Scott is now Professor Scott, and his evidence is built year on year. The general trend is for schools to be offering a maximum of six national subjects in S4, at most seven, as opposed to the norm of eight standard grades in the old system. And that has seen an average 17% decline in overall uptake by national subject. A small proportion of that to do with pupil population, yes, but largely driven by a reduction in subject choice. In arts, we've seen around a 40% decrease in enrolments in art, design and technology and in music between 2013 and 2018 in the humanities. There has been a 12% drop in modern studies, uh, which has its exams today, I think, a 35% drop in history, and a 35% drop in geography. In languages, there are 41% fewer enrolments in German now compared to then, and a 61% reduction in French. And in STEM, 23% down in biology, 28% down in chemistry, and 22% down in my old subject of physics. Indeed, Professor Scott is now telling us that some subjects are likely to disappear from the curriculum altogether, most notably certain modern languages. And he has been joined in the ensuing four years by colleagues such as Professor Mark Priestley and Dr Maria Shapira, who have demonstrated that the average number of entries per student for national fives has dropped from 5.8 in 2013, the equivalent, to 3.7 in 2016, a 37% decrease. These figures show the reality of the curriculum narrowing in term of, terms of the actual subjects pupils are able to choose as the new senior phase has been implemented. We've also heard from the likes of Reform Scotland and the Royal Society of Edinburgh We've all presented evidence of the narrowing of our school curriculum and the narrowing of subject choice. Organisations promoting the teaching of subjects such as Gaelic and geography have sounded alarm bells about what they see as an existential threat to their subjects. And in the survey carried out by the Education Committee, 76% of parents said their child had not been able to take the subjects that they wanted because of the restrictions of the curriculum. Now, the government's defence has changed over the four years and is now largely founded in outcomes and increased higher passes. We've heard that from the First Minister on a number of occasions when this topic has been raised. But it is not good enough to think that our schools are succeeding solely on the basis of success for the ablest and highest achieving pupils. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Gray for giving way. That is not the only statistic the government has used. I used the detail about 
uh, other vocational qualifications, SQA uh, quali uh, qualifications that have been achieved. I did use hires. I also talked about positive destinations. So there is a range of indicators that suggest that young people are leaving Scottish education with better outcomes than they did in the past. Ian Gray. Well, I, I, I'm afraid, as with my colleague Joanne Laman, I am never going to accept positive de destinations as a positive indicator when it includes uh, young people being exploited in zero hours contracts. And I'm sorry, if the government want to use that stat, they need to fix that and fix it soon. Professor Scott is very clear that those who leave school with national grade qualifications are the ones suffering most from all of this. And Reform Scotland show that schools in deprived areas are likely to offer a narrower curriculum. Now, the Deputy First Minister said in his contribution that what matters is what pupils leave school with. Well, perhaps he should pay attention then to the figures that show that the percentage of pupils leaving school with no qualification at all, while small, is increasing again after years of a falling trend. And this is not just about S4 either. It's not just about the impact on national exams. On the other side of the attainment gap, the evidence already presented to the committee shows that while those doing five hires are still doing five hires, uh, and why wouldn't they? The ablest pupils will always find their way through, but they are finding their choice of subject restricted by the narrower S4 choices. Preceding it, committed to too few subjects, too young, leaving them without that broad formal education of which Scotland has always been so proud. Presiding officer, the evidence that there are unintended consequences of curricular and exam reform at play here is overwhelming. The government have refused to listen for four years now. Uh, and an amendment today would simply kick this down the can down the road for another day. Again, our amendment offers a sensible way forward. And I am pleased that the Deputy First Minister accepts that because it is also four years since the OECD report Improving Schools in Scotland exactly recommended a further evaluation of CFE implementation, particularly the senior phase. That report is always made by the Cabinet Secretary, so I, I, I really uh, uh, do think that he should have no problem at all in accepting the amendment as he said he will do. And that will allow us to move this debate forward after far too long. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr. Gray. And I now call Ross Greer. Six minutes, Mr. Greer. Thank you, presiding officer. Yesterday, we were discussing the inequality emerging within instrumental music tuition in our schools. And that same issue of inequality is playing out with subject choice. From the information we have, it seems quite clear that pupils in our most deprived communities have fewer subjects to choose from than young people in the most privileged postcodes. Whatever way that's presented, it's an inequality. It's another example of the impact that poverty and the economic situation of both their family and their community are defining the life experience of young people in Scotland. Research by the Times newspaper in 2017 found that on average, pupils in some of our most deprived communities were being offered a choice of 17 hires. In the least deprived communities, often just a stone's throw away, the average offer was 23 hires to choose from. I welcome the fact that we're getting more working class Scots into university, but we aren't going to make the progress we all want, and we're not going to make it last if this gap still exists at the very qualification level that students need to get that university offer. I welcome the fact that a greater variety of qualifications and other experiences are available. The aim here isn't to get every young person through five hires in S5, but there's a danger that, as appears to be the view of some, if we explain away the reduced offer of hires in deprived communities by pointing to these other options, we're entrenching an inequality. We're maximizing the higher offer in deprived communities is never the goal because other options exist. I don't think that's anyone's intention, but it appears to be creeping in as a way of explaining away this inequality. And I mentioned the Times work from 2017 because the data that we're relying on, whether it's from the Times, Mark Priestley, Marina Shapira, or Jim Scott, is independent. It's gathered and published by journalists and academics. And therein lies one of the key problems that we have when we're discussing subject choice. Education Scotland flat out refused to acknowledge that there is or even may be an issue here, but they're not producing data to back up their assertion. The government's education agency is burying its head in the sand. 
If Education Scotland were to produce data showing that there is no pattern of pupils in more deprived areas being offered fewer hires, I'd be the first to welcome it. But right now, we have data showing the opposite is the case, and nothing more than assertion from Education Scotland. If the government were to instruct its education agency to gather this data, that would be a welcome first step. It would cut out the time-wasting exercise that we're currently engaged in, where Education Scotland claim that there is no problem. Now, one of the key issues faced by many schools sorry, um, is the uh, shortage of subject specialist teachers. We've discussed the challenges of teacher recruitment and retention a number of times before. We know that this problem is most acute in rural communities and in deprived communities, which in turn only deepens existing inequalities as those schools are simply unable to offer the same subjects as in other areas. The core issues undermining recruitment and retention of teachers are pay and workload. Again, nothing we didn't already know. Last month's pay agreement will deliver a significant rise, a restoration. This came after a strong trade union campaign for that pay rise, a campaign that saw one of the largest rallies ever organized by a single union where 30,000 people marched through Glasgow. That partial restoration in pay should go some way to tackling recruitment and retention problems, and in turn, the restrictions on subject choice that many schools are facing. But again, it's only part of the picture here. One of the core purposes of Curriculum for Excellence is to give schools the freedom to choose the best way to teach their pupils. Again, something that we all signed up to. This flexibility extends to the number of subjects which can be taken at National 5 level. We've seen schools offering anywhere from five to eight Nat 5s. But again, there appears to be a trend. Schools in the most privileged areas, the highest achieving by traditional academic standards, are often offering eight, while many others have settled on six. This raises a host of issues. Firstly, it's incredibly confusing for young people and their parents and leads many to believe that their children are missing out on the opportunities to study more subjects for no other reason than their postcode. Now, to some extent, confusion is inevitable. Curriculum for Excellence is supposed to give pupils the chance to engrade, uh, engage in greater depth with, say, six Nat Fives compared to eight standard grades in the previous system. But the combination of a still very new system and one in which there's flexibility across the country was inevitably going to generate concern. And there's still some way to go in explaining curriculum for excellence to parents, and the government should consider how, in conjunction with local councils, it can make progress on that. Beyond that, though... Yes. Thank you. Um, this morning in the Sorry, Jenny Gilbreth, I've Sorry. got to call you uh, first. This morning in the Education Committee, we were told by Eileen Pryor, the Director of Connect, that the number of nationals is not going to have any impact on whether a young person goes on to university. That's because hires are the gold standard of Scottish education. Does Ross Greer recognise that? Mr Greer. I'm actually just about to come on to a point about the uh, two-year hire and the potential for that within the system. Um, but as I said, there, there's clearly structural misalignment within the system. In fact, Jenny Ruth has very ably brought this up in committee in recent weeks. The SQA states that each Nat 5 course requires 160 hours for completion. But this isn't possible if you do eight courses in one year, as the EIS and others have repeatedly highlighted. One concerning effect of this is in some cases the start of study towards Nat 5 in S3. This is essentially mirroring the 2 plus 2 plus 2 model of the previous system, and it takes S3 out of the broad general, broad general education phase of the curriculum, which again was not an intended outcome. There is a way in which eight subjects can be studied without these contradictions to take the two-year pathway across S4 and S5, which curriculum for excellence provides for. Not all of these eight would need to lead to qualifications, though they absolutely could. And whilst this wouldn't work for every pupil, most obviously those who leave at the end of S4, it is an option that a few schools have embraced and which appears to be working, though again we would all benefit from greater study uh, on this approach, preferably led by Education Scotland. Again though, there appears to be a trend directly related to the socio-economic background of the area, one which Education Scotland needs to acknowledge and explore. Presiding officer, the principles of curriculum for excellence are the right ones, so are the priorities, but something isn't working. Rather than prescribing a solution, the motion today simply asks the government to acknowledge the serious concerns that have emerged. I hope the government can see fit to swallow their pride and just do that. Thank you. I now call Tabby Scott. Six minutes, Mr Scott. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank Liz Smith for bringing forward this debate uh, today, and I mean today, not least of which because I can't be the only constituency MSP who in the last week, because choices were being made by uh, pupils and parents all across Scotland, uh, was asked to intervene with the local high school in Shetland about the choice that this particular person, and this was someone who wanted to take a vocational route into work, uh, needed to make because the choice was limited in the columns he was trying to work in. So I'm afraid I really didn't understand Mr Swinney's attack on the rest of us for not political opportunism, but actually for doing our job. And as Ian Gray... 
and the, and the, other, the other part of this that was puzzling to me is that having uh, attacked everyone for uh, daring to bring forward a debate about subject choice and speaking to a debate about subject choice, Mr Swinney is now going to accept Ian Gray's amendment, which are, after all is very much the review that many of us have been arguing for some considerable time. So if he wants to explain the, the absolute contradiction in that position, he's more than welcome to. Cabinet Secretary. All I was arguing was that the committee is engaged in a process where there is an evidence gathering exercise underway and I simply think it's advisable to hear all of that evidence. As for the point that Ian Gray raises, it's a, a perfectly reasonable ar argument to advance. What I don't see the point of is having a debate today which has offered absolutely no policy solutions mm -hmm. when there's a committee process that's currently underway. Abby Scott. Look, well, I don't, I don't accept that analysis, not least of which because... Um, <laughs> Mr. Swinney chunters away from the front bench. I think he's. I think you know the thing about this government now. It's been in power so long that anyone who dares suggest anything different gets put down on the basis of political opportunism. That's a position uh, Mr. Swinney and Mr. Swinney is is now in. So I think he just needs to raise his game a bit. And I and actually, you know what? What really gets me is when when parents come to say to me that I have raised the issue of subject choice in Parliament because that's what I should do as their representative. I'll say to them, Mr. Swinney's response to that is, I'm guilty of political opportunism. I think they'll say to me, You're doing your job. It's about time he remembered what his is. The uh, introduction of Curriculum for Excellence is one of 22 major educational changes in Scotland since uh, the Second World War. Experts say it takes a decade or more for reform to work and to be properly assessed in its effectiveness. Now, I see no evidence that Curriculum for Excellence introduction was designed to reduce the choice of learning for young people. But the evidence now in 2019 is unambiguous. So Parliament, the government and schools do need to know what the consequence for a young person's learning is of narrowing subject choice in S4. In that assessment, the importance of different routes into work, this is a point I entirely concede to the Cabinet Secretary, informal as well as formal qualifications and the essential offering of vocational courses and experiences is indeed essential. So this is not a debate about why Scots cannot sit three hires in S5 to qualify for medicine or veterinary studies at Edinburgh University, important as that is. This is a, a debate about understanding what is going on in schools and whether we need to alter the course of the education super tanker. Few are arguing, none are arguing today for a 90 degree swing of the wheel, but some change does seem necessary. If nothing else, I cannot see why we do not want to make the subject choices at S4 to be seven rather than six in Scotland's 348 state secondaries. Nor do I see, as Ross Greer has rightly raised, why 160 hours needs to be delivered in one learning year. That sounds like a dash to learning uh, to me. And also the reality is it's not happening in many schools across the country uh, either. Seven subject choices would create space in, the, uh, in young people's learning for languages, for Gaelic, for STEM subjects, for computing science, and given Parliament debated tuition yesterday for music as well. All are worryingly in decline across Scotland. And that is surely the answer to Mr Swinney's earlier intervention uh, on Liz Smith's uh, speech uh, too. But to make this change alone, I entirely accept that the Education Secretary and schools need to know what are the unintended consequences of narrowing the subject choice. And that's why Ian Gray's amendment is, in my view, entirely right. The Education Secretary has often rested on the OECD 2015 report as his justification for various educational initiatives. And I think that is reasonable. So it is important to reflect on the significant recommendation that the OECD made in this case. It said they the need to evaluate how CFE is actually being implemented in schools and community, and for this to be done on a Scotland basis, not only in particular local authority areas, and on research they propose that, the, that research must and make a clear contribution in helping innovation in schools as learning environments, especially in secondary schools in deprived areas, a point that Ross Greer was reflecting on as well. That latter point is essential because the Cabinet Secretary's premier education advisor is Education Scotland. Worryingly for me, in Mr Swinney's speech, he did not cite Education Scotland as a basis for not having this debate today, and yet they gave two and a half hours of evidence to uh, Parliament's uh, uh, Education Committee some weeks ago. They did not offer any concrete details, statistics or numbers as to what is happening across Scotland's secondary schools on subject choice. The contrast with Professor Jim Scott could not have been uh, greater. He did say in great detail, detail what was happening. 
And if the government have want, uh, wished to take issue with that, they have every right to. But Mr Swinney did not forward any of that analysis in his speech uh, today. What Education Scotland said on teacher numbers was, it is not our responsibility on the impact of deprivation on subject choice. It says their evidence does not indicate this impacts on subject choice, but they didn't cite any evidence to support that. And on the reason behind the fall in pupils taking languages, they said twice they didn't have any statistical da data. So we do wonder what they're up to. Now, I believe uh, to, uh, the Education Secretary would be greatly supported if his premier uh, organisation responsible for advice to, uh, to him as the person responsible for education policy in Scotland did their job. The trouble at the moment is not many of us know what that job is. Thank you very much. Uh, open debate speeches of six minutes. Jenny Gilruth will be followed by Oliver Mundell. Ms Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, today is perhaps the most important day in the Scottish qualification exam diet because today is the modern studies exam. So I'd like to start by taking this opportunity to wish every pupil in Scotland setting a qualification in National 5 higher and advanced higher today the very best of luck. And to their teachers, we value your dedication, we value your commitment to our young people, and we thank you for your public service to education in Scotland. I know members will be shocked to learn this, but I studied my standard grade qualifications some 20 years ago. On Monday at the Education Committee event in Dunfermline, Ian Gray bravely and mistakenly told me that I must only have seven standard grades because I was not as bright as my youngest sister who studied nine. In fact, when I was 13 years old, Moira and John Gilruth were told by my careers advisor that I was good at science and in particular his subject of physics. Per yes, I will. Ian Gray. To, to, to be fair, you did reveal that your sister is a physics teacher, so clearly smarter than me. Jenny Gilruth. Thank Ian Gray for that. Uh, as a former modern studies teacher, I would beg to differ. Perhaps then I might like to become a doctor, so I should study physics and chemistry because she said biology is the easy science and you could pick that up in S5. Well, Moira and John were delighted with the prospect of Dr Gilruth, so science it was for me, except it wasn't. And I promptly dropped both at the end of S4, choosing instead to crash higher history. In 1999, the offer at my secondary school for everyone was seven subjects. By the time Katie Gilruth came along three years later, it was up to eight. And by the time the baby, who turned 28 on Monday, came along, she was offered nine subjects. All five council-educated pupils, three different subject offers, all went on to study five hires. Presiding officer, there has always been a variance in the number of subjects offered in S4. So to suggest that this is something new is simply not true. Yes, I will. Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful. Jim Scott's analysis shows that there are no state schools in the Highlands, Murray, Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen City offering eight subjects at S4. Several in the Central Belt do. So does the member think it acceptable that pupils in the North East are disadvantaged purely because of where they live? Jenny Gilruth. I thank Liam Kerr for that intervention. Unfortunately for him, Jim Scott also said at the same committee session on schools offering six, seven or eight qualifications, assuming the child manages to carry forward five subjects, they will be able to go on to get five hires. They are therefore not being disadvantaged and he is misleading in saying that they would be. Sorry to continue. Um, presenting officer, going back to this variance, to suggest this is something new, as Liam Kerr is trying to allude to, is not true. And, but in this job, I have I understood over the years that it is really important to consider the views of different generations in this parliament. So I learned from my colleague, Gordon MacDonald, yesterday that when he was at school, um, the so-called academic pupils were offered eight O grades and the less academic six. So I will forgive Ian Gray slur on this occasion because he assumed we still set subject choice according to ability, but that hasn't been the case for many years. Presiding officer, as the only member who has ever actually delivered a national qualification or had to write a departmental timetable as a faculty head to accommodate SQ hours allocation, I welcome today's debate. Because the fact remains that if you add up all the teaching hours available in one year, uh, which is 160 hours in terms of the exam requirements uh, to teach each subject, it is nigh on impossible to deliver more than five, perhaps six at a push in one year. And again, that is not something new. Pupils in Scotland schools have been sitting national qualifications since 2013, with the first exams taking place in 2014, five years ago. In fact, my job title as a secondia Education Scotland was that of National Qualifications Development Officer in 2012, seven years ago. 
The senior phase was meant to be about depth and learning, the broad general education, offering pupils an opportunity to study a wide range of subjects before specialising in S4. In his evidence to the Education Committee last week, Professor Jim Scott told us, to be honest, the most able pupils will cope in any system. If they are given only six or seven qualifications to work for, they will use the time well and will probably prosper in that system. So turning Professor Scott's argument on its head, it would seem to be the case that the least able pupils will not cope in any system. A system which forces all pupils to study eight or nine subjects will not allow for everyone to prosper. Where is the equity in that? No, I've taken two already, thank you. Perhaps Eileen Pryor of Connect put it best when she said at the Education Committee this morning, a focus on numbers takes our eye off the ball, which is actually about all of our young people doing the best that they can. And that has to be about the best pathways for every young person. Not, as one head teacher put it to me recently, about badge collecting. Presiding officer, I don't want to go back to standard grade. That system let too many young people down. That system put undue pressure on pupils' mental health. That system forced many to take subjects to the end of S4. But curriculum for excellence is rooted in personalisation and choice. Curriculum for excellence celebrates the achievements of all of our young people, not just those that take five hires. Curriculum for Excellence has delivered a record number of exam passes. Curriculum for Excellence has increased positive destinations. Curriculum for Excellence is narrowing the attainment gap. Presiding officer, it is nothing short of political opportunism for the Tories to come here today to debate an issue which the Education Committee hasn't even concluded its inquiry in. And I will take no lectures from any MSP in on this subject because not a single one of you has ever taught it. Before concluding, I must refer to Ian Gray and Tavish Scott's amendments, which directly reference the 2015 OECD report improving Scottish schools. Here is what the OECD said in 2015. A context of criticism could lead to a public and political debate that misses many of the most important pillars and achievements of CFE. All this would do is unnerve teachers with negative impact on morale and on the carefully built union consensus. We think it is important to avoid this negative scenario. Well, here we are, presiding officer. I am thoroughly depressed by the content of this afternoon's debate, a debate focused on politics over any form of pedagogy or commitment to getting it right for every child. Presiding officer, curriculum for excellence and all of its ambitions and achievements has certainly bypassed a few members in the chamber. Maybe it's time they went back to school. Thank you. Uh, Oliver Mundell to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Mr Mundell. Thank you, presiding officer. I think what's most galling is once again hearing this SNP government uh, and their backbenchers crying crocodile tears about being dragged to this chamber to answer for their shameful and woeful record when it comes to the education of our young people. The very same task that their First Minister claims is her government's number one priority. And if they want to talk about political opportunism, why is it that this government's so keen to avoid discussing and debating education in this chamber on government time? Yet, they can find, magically, 90 minutes for a party political broadcast on independence. Yeah. Yeah. It's little wonder that parents, teachers and pupils, the length and breadth of Scotland, can see for themselves what the Scottish National Party's real priority is. And it's certainly not about giving young people more choices. There can be no doubt that the SNP cuts to teacher numbers and Nicola Sturgeon's flawed reforms limiting choices, are limiting choices and opportunities for our young people. Yes, certainly. Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way. He, he talks about, I think he, I heard him say cuts in teacher numbers. He will be aware of the question that was answered recently, which shows that there are significantly more teachers in Scotland per pupil than there are in England under his government. Oliver Mundell. And there we have it, presiding officer. Whenever things get tough, uh, when it comes to the SNP's record across the last decade, they look somewhere else for diversion, smoke and mirror tactics. Because the truth is, there are thousands of teachers missing in Scotland. And in particular subjects, there are now no teachers at all in some schools, meaning that young people can't take the subjects of their choice. Young people themselves are disappointed because they are not able to pursue their own ambitions. They're not able to fulfil their own opportunities and they're not able to go on and study the subjects that they want at university because of limited choice yeah. and it's not acceptable and I think what's most alarming is that these opportunities appear to be most limited in our most economically deprived communities and in rural and remote communities 
outside of the central belt. For a government that claims it wants to deliver an education system based on excellence and equity, it is a downright disgrace that pupils going through education, the education system in Scotland today will be worse off than previous generations. For expert witnesses to come before the Education Committee and openly talk about a generation of pupils who have not received the choices in education they deserve should ring alarm bells for us all. And if that wasn't bad enough, if this was some kind of unforeseen accident, uh, then that, that would perhaps be forgivable. Uh, but the truth is, these concerns have been raised consistently over a number of years. It's not just today that this question's come up. It's come up time and time again in the Parliament. And what's more, a succession of SNP ministers have attempted to reassure this Parliament that a narrowing of subject choice either wouldn't happen or, worse still, was nothing to worry about. The facts, however, tell a different story. And it does seem particularly perverse that a curriculum uh, that was designed and changed with the intention of expanding choice and widening breadth has gone on for many young people to do exactly the opposite in the part of school that has most impact on where they go next. While in the past the norm at S4 was for pupils to sit seven or eight courses, the statistics now show that half of schools are offering just six in S4. In deprived areas, we're seeing that just one in 10 schools now offer the choice of 12 advanced hires. While in contrast, in our most affluent areas, seven in 10 schools are teaching 12 or more. That cannot be right, Cabinet Secretary, and that is happening on your watch. Yeah, yeah. And the SNP's new defence appears to be that opposition parties are doing teachers and young people down, that we're not pleased that people are coming out of school with qualifications. They claim that we're failing to recognise their successes and achievements. I want to say loudly and clearly on the record that is absolutely not the case. In fact, I want to go further and commend the young people and teachers who are having to work twice as hard to realise their potential and access opportunities within a system that no longer works in their best interests. What's more, it's not just opposition parties who are raising these concerns nor is it educational academics or the real experts in the front line, the teachers in our classroom, but it's young people themselves. Mm -hmm. Young people themselves are asking where is their subject choice? Mm -hmm. Year after year, the cabinet secretary and his government has chosen to ignore these voices and reside over a decline in subject choice and the opportunities that are available to the next generation of Scots. I, for one, like Ross Greer, would feel a lot more confident in the SNP government's ability to address the growing problem if ministers stopped burying their heads in the sand and actually admitted for once they might have got things wrong. Yeah. Until they do, I will make no apology for raising these issues in the chamber, as my Conservative colleagues have been doing in some cases for a decade now. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. I call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Mr MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I read in the Guardian, re Guardian recently that the former education secretary has watched as class sizes have gone up, schools have fallen into disrepair, and teachers have covered for cleaners. This is education in England. The Tories have no answer for Scot to Scottish education. In this parliament less than 12 months ago, we were debating subject choice and a motion brought by Liz Smith on behalf of the Conservative Party. Today we debate the same issue in the middle of an education committee inquiry into this area, an inquiry that only began just before the Easter recess and has not yet heard from teachers, local authorities, the SQA or the Cabinet Secretary. Indeed, we only heard from parent representative groups this morning. Third year pupils have already chosen their subjects for S4, so why now? Instead of waiting until June when we can have a more informed debate based on the Education Committee report and its recommendations, could it be there's an election in the next few weeks and the Tory party, having dropped in the polls to third place, are hoping to make political capital out of an important issue for parents and pupils? Presiding officer, as I indicated early, earlier, we heard from parent groups this morning and there were two issues that came across strongly regarding concerns about subject choice. Firstly, schools have significant autonomy in how to structure secondary education. And in many cases, they have failed to communicate to parents 
of each of their new year groups, how pupils will progress through the school, starting from the broad general education through to the senior phase when examinations take place. Joanna Murphy, Chair of the National Parents Forum of Scotland, highlighted that parents do not understand the system. They lack basic information on curriculum for excellence in the senior phase and try to relate what is currently happening to their own school experience. Yep. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you. Um, I wonder if Gordon McDonald would agree with me that perhaps we need an education campaign for MSPs because it seems to be that MSPs, maybe like parents, don't seem to understand we have a different examination system now and that things have changed since they were at school. Gordon MacDonald. Absolutely. I would support any education uh, campaign that raises the level of uh, curriculum for, evident, uh, for excellence mm -hmm. throughout the general population. Um, there is a there is a need to explain to parents what has changed and how it will benefit young people's education as schools cannot make decisions in isolation. Back in 2013, on the eve of the introduction of the senior phase into Scottish schools, the BBC highlighted that previously students studied for seven standard grades, but local authorities have consulted with schools and parent groups and six nationals is likely to be more common. One part of the thinking behind this is that it can free up the timetable to help students study topics in more depth. They also highlighted that what really matters is the number of qualifications that a youngster has when they leave school, not how many they have at a particular point. They might study more nationals after S4. We need to get that across to parents. My second point would relate to how subject choice is presented to pupils in S3. The traditional column approach to subject choice has always caused issues for young people, even back in the 70s when I was at school. You had to choose either history or geography. You could only do two sciences, etc. That to me is what is at the heart of the problem of subject choice, timetable methodology. The committee's survey of parents found that the timetable among subjects, in particular use of the column system, was the frequently cited cause of a pupil not being able to take all of the subjects they wished to study. Despite this, a majority of pupils surveyed by the Scottish Youth Parliament agreed that they were able to take all of the subjects they wanted at school. Connect, formerly Scottish Parent Teacher Council, highlighted in their submission that there were different approaches to timetabling that better met the needs of young people. They suggested Pupils should be free to select their choices and rate them in preference. Subject teaching is then matched to demand and a flexible approach adopted to class and year structures so that different levels may be taught together with young people from different year groups. The important point is to give pupils as much possible free choice in subject decisions throughout the senior phase, whether it is S4, S5 or S6. As Joanna Murphy, Chair of the National Parents Forum of Scotland, stated, it's about what they leave with, not what order they do things. Scotland school leavers have higher achievement levels and higher positive destinations than at any time during the last 20 years. In 2006-07, the percentage of pupils getting a level five qualification, a credit in the old standard grade, or better, was 71%. Now, whilst we cannot make a direct comparison, the percentage you got a level five qualification or better last year was 86%. For hires, again, we're unable to make a direct comparison, but last year, 62% of school leavers left with a qualification at level six or better, up from 42% in 2006 and seven. Back in 2009, the percentage of pupils who got five hires or more was 22%. Last year, it was more than 30%. Presiding officer, there have been concerns for years about the attainment gap between pupils with different backgrounds. Education Scotland and their evidence to the committee highlighted that the attainment gap between rich and poor at higher level is at an all-time low. A record number of school leavers are in higher education mm -hmm. and a number of school leavers from the most deprived areas in higher education has gone up by eight percentage points since a decade ago. And, and there you must conclude, Mr MacDonald. Okay, thank thank you. you very much. I call Joanne Lamont to be followed by James Dornan.
Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, here we are, another education debate with our Cabinet Secretary for Education taking, I think, a troubling, um, increasingly common approach in listening to the arguments. He holds the line, seeks to shoot the messenger, quotes carefully selected statistics to make a case, and I have to say, the kindest construction I would put that on that is largely in denial about many of the areas of concern about the education experience of too many of our young people. And I say in all seriousness to our colleagues across the chamber, belligerence is not a substitute for being accountable for your responsibilities. And again, in education debate, in opposition time, I have lost count of the times I've asked the Cabinet Secretary to provide time in Scottish Government time to debate fully the whole range of areas in education. I would hate to suggest that it's political opportunism that has meant that we have not had those debates in government time. So in the time that I have, I want to explore some of the evidence given to our committee and heard elsewhere about perhaps unintended consequences of decisions around subject choices, the local pressure on resources, notably of teachers and support staff, on some of the most disadvantaged young people in our edu education system. We have heard troubling and compelling evidence from, from Professor Jim Scott that the way the curriculum for excellence is now being implemented means that the system is less fair for those who are most disadvantaged and that they are paying the price of less equity because of deliberate choices by government, by Education Scotland, by local authorities and by schools. It is simply not good enough to try and shrug off that evidence. We have heard evidence of routinely greater use of multi-level teaching in classes, increased needs of lack of availability within schools for young people to travel to college and other schools to access particular subjects. Subject choice is more restricted, and not necessarily just the number, but the range of subjects. And for me, the most concerning, the increase in young people leaving with no external examination qualification whatsoever. All of these things that have been highlighted disproportionately impact on the poorest and most disadvantaged young people in the system. There are decisions being played out now which disproportionately impact on those who are already, dis who those who already disproportionately battle inequality and injustice. We know, for example, that 75% of looked after young people leave at end of S4. How is a curriculum that you have to be there for four, five and six to access all of its benefits tailored to their needs? It is not tailored to their needs at all. And I would ask the Cabinet Secretary if he shares my concern that Education Scotland not only has done no quality, equality impact assessment on the choices being made by them, but continues blithely to argue that there is no cause for concern. And I have to be honest here. It is the complacency and the defensiveness that gets to me. There's nothing to see here. They would say that approach. All this while alarm bells are ringing and serious figures in education with no political dog in the fight are expressing their concerns. And Education Scotland gives advice to ministers, inspects its own work and does not reflect that teaching a class with assistant higher, higher National 5 and National 4 in the same room presents any difficulties whatsoever. I'm telling you, the most advantaged children aren't being taught in these circumstances. The most disadvantaged are. That is unacceptable. And in conclusion, may I say this to the Cabinet Secretary? I get that many people simply resist change. They misunderstand the decisions and curriculum that are being made. I hear the pushy parents' explanation that we shouldn't focus just on qualifications. It's not just about the exams. Even if all of that is true, there is still some truth in the problems that we've got. I believe the problem is deeper and cannot be wished away. Fewer subjects, narrower range of choice, and the further disadvantage of those who are most vulnerable. The easy bit, frankly, for the Cabinet Secretary is to delete the concerns in a parliamentary motion. It's a great deal harder to delete the consequences of his choices from the life chances of young people across Scotland. The Cabinet Secretaries should say we wait until the inquiry completes its work. Well, I seriously hope that when the, the Cabinet Secretary sees the evidence, he stops trying to explain it away. He needs to listen, understand and act, not just test it against his own view, but recognise there may possibly be things going wrong in the system that he didn't intend, but are having direct consequences for many of our young people. This is not just the timing. 
not just a parliamentary process that is flung in as a justification for not supporting the motion. This is an issue of the responsibility of serious government to confront and respond to what's happening in the real world at its hand. And it is not good enough to respond with cheap points about process when you actually have to look at what people across this country are saying about the damage we are doing possibly to the future of far too many of our young people. I now call James Dornan, followed by Alison Harris. Mr Dornan. Thank you very much, President Officer. Given, as many people have already said, the Education and Skills Committee are in the middle of taking evidence on this topic, I do have to wonder why the Conservative Party have decided to take on this debate at this time. I wasn't going to use this next bit, but thank you, Oliver, you've given me the opportunity to do so. For the Tories to shed crocodile tears about inequity is ignorance at best and sheer hypocrisy at worst. If it wasn't, then this debate would be about the causes of poverty and a call for this party, this parliament, to urge Westminster to A, scrap some of their more damaging policies and B, grant this parliament all the powers it requires to deal with this problem in its totality. Yes, I will do. Oliver Mundell. I think it's absolutely outrageous uh, to make that kind of point, but does James Dornan not accept that uh, giving people an inadequate education, a less... Uh, a, a less... Uh, good quality education uh, than their peers in more affluent communities is going to have an impact on their life chances. James Dornan. Uh, yes, I would agree with that point if I thought that was the case. At FMQs last week, the First Minister was right to point out that a record number of young people are leaving school with five hires or more and that the attainment gap between the richest and poorest is narrowing. That's thanks to policies such as a pupil, equ pupil equity fund, which allows head teachers to use a financial settlement to suit their establishment's particular needs, rather than a blanket rule of practice which has no flexibility. It's work like this which will truly allow head teachers to prioritise the needs of pupils of their area, taking into account socio-economic backgrounds and particular social challenges. The SNP government is absolutely committed to the needs of vulnerable children, and there are clearly some young people who will need a more targeted support than others, for example, those coming from a care experience background. And the government's already recognised this demographic by the may need further investment and has pledged £33 million from the Attainment Scotland Fund, funding which will offer targeted initiatives, activities and educational resources which will aim to improve the educational outcomes for this disadvantaged group of young people. I will do. Joanne Lamont. I'm very grateful for you to take the intervention. I wonder if you would recognise the argument I was making, which is not about what the, the Tories are doing at Westminster, I condemn their project in terms of cuts to public services. The, the danger is what we're doing now is amplifying inequality in our communities by some of the choices that have been made around curriculum for excellence, unintended or otherwise. We do need to address that because kids in our communities that we represent are being disadvantaged and disadvantaged more by those choices being made. James Dorn, I'll give you your time back, Mr Dorn. That was a long much, intervention. Signal, sir. Can, can I say, uh, uh, Joanne Lamont, that, that I, I would be happy to agree with that if we would go through the process that you're already in the, uh, in the middle of. If you had come back here after your, the committee debate, the committee discussion, you came back with evidence that proved that, then it would be very difficult for us in these benches to say otherwise. But what's happened here is, and it is for political reasons, there's no, nothing else. I'm not saying that the speeches that others have made have been for political reasons, but this motion here today has been brought for political reasons. There's no other possible reason it could be. I can see some of my colleagues to my left wanting me to specifically talk solely about subject choices, but having served as a convener of education for some time, I'm more than aware that a child's education isn't quite so one-dimensional. Another reason why I'm so surprised <laughs> that Liz Smith has brought forward this debate at such an early stage, because she has heard, before she's heard the, the vast bulk of evidence, she's heard time and time again the education of children within different socioeconomic areas is a very complex one. And the rest of us know that too. In a debate last year, I had the joy of sharing some stories about young people in my constituency who'd achieved outstanding results in their exams. But what surprised me about many of the stories was the element of cross-establishment working between schools in my Glasgow Cathcart constituency. Many kids travel between schools to participate in various subjects with excellent outcomes. It means that schools benefit from offering a well-attended subject and pupils are able to utilise that flexible approach in order to study the subjects which are most suitable to their needs. 
Indeed, in 2017, one such pupil in S4 attended Holyrood Secondary for her higher Italian, Kings Park Secondary for higher ESOL, while being taught higher Spanish and National 5 Maths at her own school, St Margaret Mary's. And that's the point of Curriculum for Excellence. It's about a tailored educational system which is a flexible approach to learning. And I do not dispute for a minute that, that some parents may have concerns over six subjects being offered in S4, but I repeat the First Minister's words from last Thursday, higher education doesn't simply finish in S4, and a wide range of subjects are open to pupils as they progress through S5 and S6. And as the Cabinet Secretary says earlier on, eh, the, the broad general education has been improved up to the S3. What matters is the qualifications and awards that pupils leave school with, not just the subjects that they study at S4. And while the government has promised to monitor the Reform Scotland report and the Education and Skills Committee's review, it's absolutely right that we know that education doesn't end then. The evidence says that more young people leaving school with qualifications, more young people leaving school with five hires or more, and more young people going into positive destinations, including university. And, presiding officer, I want to take a minute to examine the wording of this Tory motion. Inequity that You've exists got exactly one minute. One minute. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, and more deprived communities. I represent a constituency that has a number of those more deprived communities. And in a recent visit by the UN Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, Professor Philip Alston visited a school in Glasgow and asked the children who should help the poor people. He was answered by one child with simply the rich people. A boy, John, was in the garden saying, I get hungry because I was smelling other people's food. The most unfair thing is that government knows what families are going through and they decide not to do anything about it. Now, that is a perfect example of inequity that exists between schools in more affluent areas and those in more deprived communities, which clearly affects education performance. I say to Scotland's Tories, don't insult this parliament by telling us this is how we should be educating the poor. Tell us how you will fight alongside us to ensure those children aren't poor in the first place. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I call Alison Harris to be followed by John Mason. Ms Harris. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would like to thank my colleague Liz Smith for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. It is so important because the options available for Scotland's children as they progress through school are sadly narrowing. The Curriculum for Excellence was introduced with the intention of improving the Scottish education system, a system that was renowned internationally as one of the best. Unfortunately, Evidence has shown that the curriculum's implementation has been lacking in accountability, communication and credible management. What's worse, the response to this evidence so far from the SNP and Education Scotland has been utter denial. Mm -hmm. In recent years, there has been a narrowing of subject choice for children at the senior phase of their education. Those entering S4 now take on average fewer subjects than they did before the Curriculum for Excellence was introduced. It is abundantly clear to most members in the chamber what effect limiting the horizon can have on a child. So, how has that happened? Part of the transition from the old system to the new one involved changing the structure through which education is delivered. Previously, under the 222 system, children in S3 and S4 could take a breadth of subjects before focusing on their hires in fifth year. Having now switched to 3-3, where the first three years are known as broad general education, we are faced with problems. Evidence submitted to the Education Committee highlights the disjointedness between the first three years and the new senior phase. The SQA have said that their qualifications, starting in S4, require 160 hours of teaching per subject to pass. Previously, this time could be split over two years. But now schools are cramming these 160 hours into one, meaning the seven and eight subject slots have been squeezed down to six and sometimes even five. I've heard members say that we are focusing too much on S4 and that subjects are available throughout the whole senior phase. To them, I would say that the idea of a child who has got a flavour of Spanish in, say, S1 to S3 and who was then forced to drop it because they only had six slots in S4, would somehow pick it up again later in the senior phase is totally unrealistic. Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way. I can understand why there's a debate about many of the, the things that uh, the member is talking about, but can I just be clear, is the member calling for more regulation from the centre of what schools do or less? Alistair Harris. 
Mr Allen, thank you for that question. We're calling for a review of the structure. Okay. Right. I now want to turn to a, a particularly worrying development. We have been hearing increased reports of multi-level classes. Science teachers, for example, have pointed out the stark differences in the content between national four, five and higher physics qualifications, yet they're often expected to teach all three of these in one class time slot. In last week's Education Skills and Committee, I asked the panel whether courses are actually built to sustain this kind of learning. In their answers, William Hardy highlighted the impractical <laughs> impracticality of teaching what in some cases are very different courses in the same class and expecting the same quality of education. Dr. Alan Britton said that no teacher would choose to do this. And, uh, to, and Professor Jim Scott said that the extent of tri-level teaching is worrying. However, Education Scotland were asked about this when they gave evidence to the committee. At one point, their strategic di director said that children could receive the same education experience in a multi-level class as they would in a same level class. I find this response quite surprising. So this brings me on to the final section of my contribution to this debate. The reduction in subject choice for Scottish children upsets me. But what really angers me is the frank denial from the SNP and Education Scotland on the seriousness of this issue. In that same committee, Education Scotland suggested that the narrowing of subject choice was in fact a deliberate decision so that children could focus on a depth of learning. But educational experts have been very clear that this narrowing is an unintentional consequence of the curriculum for excellence. Similarly, responding to Ross Greer on the sad reality that some children have to travel from one school to another to take certain subjects, the strategic director claimed that the motivation from travelling to such a class more than makes up for missing any other activities like sport, drama or music. This very statement is a shameful denial of the problems. Last week at First Minister's questions, the denials kept coming. The First Minister was questioned on the topic of subject choice nine times by five different MSPs from across the chamber. And in each answer, she just repeated the same one statistic, irrespective of the question. The SNP are acting like there isn't a problem. Well, there is a problem. I know that I speak for parents, teachers and educationalists around Scotland when I say that we need to address this head on. No more denials, no more deflections or downright ridiculous excuses. Let's address this problem before we fail a generation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I call John Mason to follow by Jenny Mara. Mr Mason, please. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I guess there is quite a lot we can agree on today. Uh, education should be based on excellence and equity, the best possible education at all levels. These principles are enshrined in the policy aims of Curriculum for Excellence. All of these appear in the uh, original motion and are not amended. Now, our focus today is on subject choice, and I think the Conservatives want young people to have as wide a choice as possible in each school. But that, I feel, is quite a narrow topic, and they are certainly entitled to debate it. However, I would also like to make some wider but related points on the issue of school pupils and subject choices. The number of subjects available in a school is important, but so also is the question of what these subjects are. We need to ask ourselves how and why pupils choose particular subjects, or on, as well, we'd like to choose particular subjects which are not available. How much should we as a society be trying to influence pupils, and how much should their choice be completely free? The Economy Committee of which I'm a member is concluding an inquiry into the construction sector, and previously we published a report on the gender pay gap. In both of these inquiries, it has been blatantly obvious that we are not attracting enough women into STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and for that matter, not enough men into childcare and primary teaching. Efforts have been made to change this, but success has been limited. For whatever reason, pupils are still choosing careers which follow fairly traditional gendered lines, 
and this in turn is reflected in their subject choice at school. And I think we are all struggling to know how to change this. In 2017-18, at the higher level, the SQA tell us that 90% of those doing engineering science were male, 84% doing computing science were male, 97% of those doing fashion and textile technology were female, and 97% doing childcare and development were also female. Now, families, peers, and teachers can all have an influence on the choices of school subjects and careers which our young people make. And frankly, we need our schools sometimes to be challenging some of the assumptions that are around our young people and that they are trying to pick up, are picking up from elsewhere. I think we all know some of the wrong assumptions that are floating around. For example, construction always involves being out in a muddy building site. Engineering is a very physical job and better for boys. Doctors and lawyers are better jobs than engineers. In an, let me finish this point. In an ideal world, everyone would go to university. The best people do not do, go into construction. All of these are wrong assumptions and they need to be challenged. Joanne Lamont. Joanne Lamont. I agree with you that we, we need to challenge those. If the evidence um, to the Education Committee concludes with a view that confirms Professor Jim Scott's position, which is the most disadvantaged are now more disadvantaged than they were before, what do you, would you want to act to get the Scottish Government to address that problem? John Mason. Well, I mean, I think that's a bit hypothetical. And one of the points today is what will the, uh, edu the Education Committee actually come up with as a conclusion? I, I would have to say, um, by way of example, my own a constituency, which is quite mixed, as members will know. A, one of the big challenges is parental involvement. And a, one of the schools which I think is doing a good work in this area has used some of the extra money, the PEF money, a, to in, actually involve families. Because when families are more involved in education, that makes a, as big a difference as other, as, as other things. I think my main argument here is that this is wider than just the number of subjects. And there are a whole lot of factors in here, a, apart from a just the number of subjects. You, well, I think let me finish, go, do a little more, and then maybe come in afterwards. Uh, to continue my theme, during Scottish Apprenticeship Week recently, I visited an excellent company in my constituency who provided electrical and other services. I met two very able apprentices, one older and one younger. And it was particularly interesting listening to the younger one as he spoke of his experience at his school, I don't know which one it was, where the emphasis seemed to be on going to university and the impression was given to pupils that everything else apart from university was second rate. We need to help our young people understand that this kind of thinking is wrong. We use the term positive destinations, which is meant to include a range of destinations. But in practice, we can send out the signal that academic is best. The roofer who fixes my tenement roof is just as important and valuable as a lawyer or accountant. After all, if 100% of our young people went to university, that would be a failure for us as a society. Of course, each young person should have an equal opportunity to go to university, no matter what their background is. But it is not the right path for every young person. It's good in Scotland that we have a tradition of a broad general education, and I studied Latin up to fourth year and chemistry to fifth year, neither of which appears to have done me much good since. I think the only subject I actually enjoyed at school was maths, but I guess it would not have been healthy for me only to study that. So I was forced to study other things. However, I think we as a society have a responsibility to encourage our young people into sectors where there are likely to be skills shortages in the future and preferably also where there are good pay and career opportunities. I studied accountancy at university because I wanted to become an accountant. I did not just choose the subject in some kind of random way, although I have to say I didn't know much about it because accountancy was not even available at the school I went to. I'm running out of time, presiding officer, so in conclusion, I agree that the number of subjects available for an individual young person to choose from is important, but it is only one angle on the topic of subjects and choices that we as a society need to take a much wider look at the whole question of what subjects are being chosen and why, and we need to consider if these are the best subjects for the individual young person and for society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny Mara. we followed by Claire Adams and Ms. Mara. Presiding officer, let me start uh, this afternoon by echoing Ross Greer's call for more time on this debate. Frankly, 
I think the process point about the stage of the committee process is beneath the Cabinet Secretary. The evidence that the committee heard was really so stark and shocking that I think it shows that Parliament is fleet of foot to actually look at what we learned. And if the Cabinet Secretary wanted to, to devote a whole week of parliamentary time, I'm sure that would be welcomed across the Chamber on this very important topic. Presiding officer, I'm as concerned as any uh, opposition member about the narrowing choice of uh, subjects in school at S4 level. And I was quite taken with uh, Jenny Gilruth's contribution earlier on when she gave us her family history on this, saying that her and her sisters, I, if I heard correctly, were offered seven, eight and nine choices of subjects, but then told us that she was satisfied now that pupils are being offering six. And if, I, and if I understood her correctly, that not many of us apart from her understand I, I, will let her, I will let her come in once I've done this point. But if I understand correctly that not many of us, apart from her, understand the education uh, process, I would ask her, why is it that some of the most affluent areas in Scotland, their state schools, are offering pupils the opportunity to study seven and eight qualification? Why is that? Jenny Gilbreth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I made the point in my contribution that there's always been a variation within the a system. So going back to standard grade 20 years ago, it's always been there. And on the point of deprivation, you need to look at a more broader range of qualifications. So for example, yesterday in our contribution, in our debate, Daniel Johnson told us that he supported the wider definition of education. Ian Gray said it wasn't all about exam passes. Will Jenny Mara not listen to some of her Labour colleagues? Jenny Mara. I don't disagree with anything that they said. I hope, presiding officer, I might get that time back. But the disparity we see on a national scale, that's the point I make, is, is really worrying. And it simply cannot be right, in my view, that pupils in wealthier areas of the country have a greater range of choices than those in other communities. Because schools are clear. They offer a limited range of topics because that is all they can afford with the staffing and resources they have. The cut of more than 3,000 teachers across Scotland since the SNP came to power is one of this government's greatest failings. My own city of Dundee has been hit hard by teacher cuts. Since 2009, when the SNP took control of Dundee City Council, we have lost 183 teachers in total, with more to come. A massive 160 of those teachers have been lost to our secondary schools in Dundee. Things are so bad that schools struggle to recruit teachers in core subjects such as English, maths and science. And in a city where we are already struggling with attainment, we see that the SNP is planning to cut a further £3 million from the education budget. On top of that, teachers are under further pressure with the move to the almost universally unpopular faculty heads management structure. With schools under that kind of pressure, the last thing our pupils need is a restriction in subject choices. Now in Dundee, where we really need the opportunities offered by a good and solid education, five of our eight secondary schools responded to the Reform Scotland survey to confirm that they only offer the six subjects in S4. The three schools who didn't respond to that survey have offered the same choice of six subjects over the past few years. And then we discover that it is SNP Council policy to offer only six subjects. So what the Cabinet Secretary says about supporting head teachers and variants, I say to him loudly and clearly today, if he's listening, that those options are not available to pupils, parents and schools or head teachers in Dundee because the SNP Council has said very clearly that it will be six subjects right across the city in S4. The, the, the S1-6 curriculum guideline states, issued by the Council, the senior phase model we have adopted as a city allows for vertical and lateral progression. Pupils can study a maximum of six subjects at National 4 and 5 in S4. We should be under no illusions that such a restriction really does limit the choices and outcomes for pupils. And I would repeat the point again, I do not understand the SNP's assertion that a narrowing of the curriculum is good when we see some of the most affluent areas of this country offering their pupils an opportunity to take eight, seven and eight qualifications at S4. I thought Professor Jim Scott's uh, evidence was really quite striking. 
and his initial research indicates that in an environment where only six choices are allowed, the average number of qualifications attempted is only five. And that is worrying in itself, and it's a point that's yet to be addressed in this debate. Those children with ambitions to study medicine or engineering are being left with no choice but to give up the benefits of art subjects and to start specialising early in order to gain the qualifications they need for their chosen career. As Professor Scott said in that submission, any significant reduction in the uptake of modern languages, expressive arts and the STEM subjects has the potential to impair the academic, scientific, cultural and business related capacity of Scotland. As everyone in this chamber knows, this debate is about education, but it is about our wider economic capabilities as well. Presiding officer, we know that our children are being offered limited subject choices not because the Scottish Government believes perhaps this is right, although the debate today maybe contests that, but because they are too set in their ways and I think too arrogant to look objectively at the situation in front of us. I believe the Cabinet Secretary must now act to turn around the collapse in budgets, the crisis in recruitment and the narrowing of subject chances and life choices that his SNP mismanagement is inflicting on our schools. I'd like to call Claire Adamson to be followed by Graham Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak somewhat dismayed at some of the arguments that are being used in the Chamber this afternoon. I served in this Education and Culture Committee in Session 4 of the Parliament, and much of what we have been discussing today was raised in evidence at this time. That was the opening of my speech last year, and I'm even more dismayed that we're still talking about some of the same issues and the understanding of curriculum for excellence doesn't seem to have made its way through to some areas of the chamber. If I can quote Larry, Terry Lanigan of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland in 2012, he said, the new system is not about going for eight or nine qualifications in one year. It is a continuum of learning. Those are not just words. The new qualifications will and do build on experience and outcomes in broad general education. It was always intended, and from the, the work that was done uh, in the criticism of the, of the system that was there before, that it should be a depth of learning that was there for young people, not a breadth of learning. And while I absolutely agree that the evidence shows that the number of subjects have reduced in certain areas, I have yet to see any evidence of the disadvantage for young people. And I want to use the evidence that the committee has already he heard to demonstrate that. But in the context of what had been said in the past, La Terry Lanigan also said, the two plus two versus three plus three issue is a false dichotomy. Broad general education goes up to S3, but that does not mean that there is a choice before that stage. Indeed, personalisation and choice are an entitlement of curriculum for excellence. We've known that the criticism of the previous one was that two-term dash to hire. But we also know that curriculum for excellence offers an opportunity for pupils to go straight to higher courses, for S3 to start the process into the, the NAP 4 and 5 work that the young people will do. That is the whole basis of it being adapted and personalised to the young person involved. And I heard about comparisons also with the private sector. Well, can I say some private sector schools do not even, didn't even set standard grades. Their pupils went straight to higher. So there always has been differing um, views of how that should be taken forward. But Lanny, Terry Flanagan's most important um, comment that I want to, to highlight today is that if at the end of all of this, all we have done is replace the exams, then we have not changed the pedagogical approach in schools or what year youngsters make their future choices, we will not have achieved curriculum for excellence. And curriculum for excellence was supported by all parties across this chamber. If I could talk a little bit about the evidence, because I am a little bit concerned that we're having this debate in the context of a committee inquiry because it's a very important committee inquiry and we are only part way, way through that process. And I think it's, you know, the optics of this could be that people's minds have been made up before all the evidence has been heard. And I think it's really important we listen to all of that. So I want to balance some of the things that have been said about the evidence today. Uh, Dr Shapira was mentioned by both Liz Smith and by Ian Gray. 
uh, and she talked about but when pressed and I absolutely agree there is an arrowing and it has been linked to SIMD areas uh, when pressed as to what evidence there was of disadvantage to those young people she said the question is do we have the evidence that the narrow choice has a negative effect overall we will have to look and wait and see to have a look at the trends in a couple of years time so while I get the concern and probably share the concern of the members around the chamber who have mentioned this, I've yet to see how we are disadvantaging our young people, especially in the context that universities and colleges admissions are increased up by 4% last year. The attainment and leaver destinations are 92.9% .9 of our pupils in positive destinations. It has gone up and I, I shared Labour's concern about counting um, zero hours contracts in this, but that's a, a small percentage of what the positive destinations are for our young people. If we look at some of the other evidence that's been given, um, Alistair Sim of um, University of Scotland has um, particularly said, an individual's ability to present a good range of qualifications is core to university entry. entry. One of the good things about Curriculum for Excellence and something that resonates strongly with what we are trying to do at university is that through the experience of Curriculum for Excellence, pupils develop a broader attributes that I referred to as well as subject knowledge. That helps to get people who have a rounded expertise as well as subject knowledge and I, I, I support this intention. So what we are seeing is, is universities looking for an experience that's not just about what the, the pupils have achieved in a certain number of qualifications it's looking about their the bag of qualifications that they leave s5 or s6 with in the final final um, stages of curriculum for excellence and we've also heard a lot about the opportunities and choices but can i say also that john mckay said in on creative in the creativity of cfe that there are, are uh, um, we're able to see where computing science teacher is not in a school, but that, that colleges have been introducing to Dean Angus College now to HNC higher level. So the teacher is therefore free to develop more courses for young, more young, youngsters to meet their needs, and the pupils are attaining the qualification they want through the college system. And this is the advantages of what's happening. I wait to be convinced to see. Although I share the concerns, I wait to be convinced that there is the problem that has been highlighted by other members around there. And I look forward to concluding our committee's work in this area. Thank you very much. I call Graeme Simpson to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it is a somewhat extraordinary situation, is it not, uh, when we have a Cabinet Secretary for Education saying that this uh, Parliament should not debate education. Education uh, should never be off limits for members in this chamber. It is the job of Parliament to debate serious issues and this is a serious issue. If it wasn't a serious issue then we wouldn't have the Education Committee looking at it. If it wasn't a serious issue then we wouldn't have tabled the motion that Liz Smith has done today. Now, in March 2013, the Commission on School Reform, uh, which I was lucky enough to sit on, published a detailed document called By Diverse Means. It was a serious attempt to suggest ways in which we could improve Scotland's educational performance, but nothing's happened since to do that. Our paper started off with two quotes, by diverse means we arrive at the same end and never tell people how to do things tell them what to do and they will surprise you with their ingenuity. In other words, trust people to do a job and allow them to do it in different ways. It was clear then and clear now that the education system in Scotland is too uniform. And that's why the Scottish Conservatives have been arguing for years that we need greater diversity in the system and that we need to empower properly head teachers. Yeah. Curriculum for Excellence was meant to take the shackles off. It should have led to greater choice, not less. Last week, subject choice was brought up several times at First Minister's questions, and frankly, she floundered. I looked around the chamber, and I spotted Mike Russell on the front bench. He's a very bright man. He's obviously well-educated, 
And I couldn't help wondering if a young Mike Russell going through school now would emerge with the breadth of knowledge of the current Mike Russell. I doubt it. The same could be said for other um, equally educated members like Liz Smith, Ian Gray, and many, many others. We have a narrowing of the curriculum and we have kids being taught subjects at different levels in the same classes. You cannot possibly argue that that's a good thing. We've already heard about Professor Jim Scott's evidence. He said the narrowing of subject choice was like a virus that spread around the north of Scotland with outbreaks in the south and southwest. And he warned we're in danger of a generation going past who've not had a good experience in education. He said, quote, I've trouble saying to you that anything is improving this at all. Professor Scott identified five areas where Scottish education is struggling, modern languages, ICT, arts, technologies, and in science, technology, engineering, and maths. There's a postcode lottery throughout Scotland and within authorities. Let me take South Lanarkshire, where I live. I asked the council for the figures. No, I'm gonna give figures in South Lanarkshire. It's an SNP council. The number of choices offered at S4 goes from nine at Stonelaw High, eight at Trinity, St. Andrews and St. Brides and Holy Cross, seven at Calder Glen, Calderside, Duncan Rigg, Lark Hall, Lesmahago, St. John Ogilvy, Straven and Uddingston, down to six at Bigger, Carluk, Hamilton Grammar and Lanark. So that's all the high schools, quite a range. I should sound a word of caution here and the cabinet secretary may agree with me. While Stone Law shows nine, in theory, a uh, pupil could access nine quali national qualifications, it also captures their activities, such as the Duke of Edinburgh, Saltire Awards, etc., that pupils can do within the timetable. Whereas Hamilton Grammar, which only had six, uh, uh, that doesn't reflect the wider range of options available. Now, nevertheless, you have to ask, why should a kid at Bigger not have the same opportunities as someone at St. Andrews and St. Bride's in East Kilbride? Yeah. Or maybe, maybe the question is, why don't they? And here, teacher shortages is a large part of the problem, as Jenny Mara said. We just don't have enough people to teach across the wide variety of subjects that could be offered. We've known about this for years, and yet nothing, it seems to me, has been done. <laughs> Last week, the First Minister trumpeted exam results as evidence that curriculum for excellence is working. She was kind of missing the point, because is it really? The percentage of youngsters leaving school with no qualifications has declined uh, across almost all authorities from 2009-10 to 2012-13. But unfortunately, as Ian Gray said, the opposite is true after the introduction of curriculum for excellence. So the least able appear to be suffering the most under curriculum for excellence. I thought Aberdeenshire Council summed it up quite well in their submission to the committee. They said, clearly limitations in subject choice restrict the choices a pupil can make and can lead them into choosing subjects in which they have little interest. This can affect their motivation and overall attainment. The Spice paper this week confirmed that. Restricting subject choice leads to kids sitting subjects they're just not interested in. And that can affect them for the rest of their lives. And that, Cabinet Secretary, is why this matters. Yeah. Thank you. I call Ruth McGuire and then we'll move to closing speeches. Ruth McGuire. Presiding officer, I think we all agree that Scottish education should be based on the principles of excellence and equity, and it's of course important to be assured that this is the case. The Cabinet Secretary and colleagues have made observations about the timing of this debate, not about debating education, but about the timing of this specific debate. Choices have, ab have already been made for next year, and the Education and Skills Committee inquiry is not finished. Those are facts. Viewers of this debate might wonder if the sensible and respectful way to proceed would have been to let the committee do its job and have a more informed debate in June after the inquiry. 
the Education and Skills Committee is yet to hear from and crucially question a range of important witnesses, including representatives of the professional associations, directors of education, local government and indeed the Scottish Government. In everything we do in this place, we must properly consider and scrutinise evidence and I sincerely hope that we can have the opportunity to return to this matter when the Education and Skills Committee has done its job and had the opportunity to review the full range of evidence and its report is available to all of us. The purpose of the curriculum is to provide our young people with the skills, knowledge and experiences which will prepare them for lives beyond school and provide them with the best possible opportunities to fulfil their potential. Under Curriculum for Excellence, there are no set notions about the number or types of qualifications taken at each senior phase. The guiding principle is that qualifications are taken at the appropriate stage for the young person over the three years of the senior phase. It's for schools to make decisions about the best model for their young people, and of course this will lead to variation. National guidelines encourage flexibility and enable schools to consider alternative approaches that best meet pupils' needs. That's right. For example, that may include following courses at college, through consortium arrangements with other schools and through digital learning. Presiding officer, our focus must be on the whole school experience, the range of qualifications that are achieved and the destinations of young people when they leave school. Responding to the committee, one local authority reports that the greater flexibility of the timetable has been matched by increasing option choice. Alongside traditional courses, schools now offer wider achievement opportunities, ranging from vocational qualifications to leadership and employability awards, many of which are also certified, and courses offering different types of work related to learning. Importantly, they also state, while the curriculum offer has been changing, examination performance has held up, continuing to improve steadily as before. And that matters, the qualifications and awards that young people leave school with matters, not just what they study in S4. The percentage of pupils who get qualifications... I will. Joanne Lamond. Here, my concern that increasing number of young people are leaving with no qualification whatsoever, and it will be disadvantaged young people that are suffering most. Ruth McGuire. If that was the case, I would, I would share that concern. Of course I would. The percentage of pupils who get qualifications at level five and above is up. The percentage of pupils who leave with hires is up. The wealth-related attainment gap for high higher level is at an all-time low. A record number of school leavers are in higher education. And, presiding officer, when you look at attainment when pupils leave school, you find two things. Attainment overall is up since 2009-10, and the gap between the most and least deprived is narrowing. Curriculum for Excellence has transformed learning experiences for children and young people across Scotland. It recognises that children are unique and empowers teachers to create learning that makes sure every child gets the support, stretch and challenge they deserve. And it's the right approach for Scotland. No. The OECD have endorsed Scotland's curriculum as resting on a very contemporary view of knowledge and skills and on widely accepted tenets of what makes for powerful learning. Curriculum for Excellence has gone through a significant period of initial implementation, which brought with it a period of intensive change, particularly for secondary schools. The priority now should be to allow the new curriculum to bed in, to make appropriate adjustments, but to avoid the type of wholesale curriculum change which would simply increase the workload for teachers. Presiding officer, as I said at the beginning, we all agree that Scottish education should be based on the principles of excellence and equity, and we need to be assured that this is the case. Let's do that the right way. In everything we do in this place, we must properly consider and scrutinise the evidence. I repeat my hope that we can have the opportunity to return to this subject matter when the Education Skills Committee has had the opportunity to review the full range of evidence and when its report is available to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now move to closing speeches. I call on Ian Gray to wind up for the Labour Party. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Um, Ruth McGuire there and Claire Adamson too before I talked about the choice and personalisation which uh, Curriculum for Excellence uh, allows. And that is a good thing. I am very much in favour of choice and personalisation in our schools and I have been for a very, uh, very long time. I remember uh, decades ago uh, sitting in a school in uh, Mozambique speaking to a, a colleague who was a Soviet teacher um, and he uh, asked me about 
uh, how our schools were organised. Now, I knew how Soviet schools were organised, the, uh, the kind of school you were in. Every pupil in that year uh, had exactly the same course, which they followed the same subjects. And in fact, across the entire Soviet Union, on a particular day, they would be studying the same page in their textbook. And in order to move on to the next year, they had to pass all their subjects. So uh, he explained that to me, which I knew, and I explained to him that in uh, the schools I was used to working in, <coughs> pupils studied the same courses for a couple of years, and then after that, they chose their own personalized curriculum. And he looked at me and said, that's just not possible. Um, because it was a degree of personalization which he thought was just impractical, that you couldn't run or organize the school uh, on that basis. Um, and uh, I, I tried to convince him that it was possible, uh, but couldn't convince him. Uh, and it struck me then how different the two systems were, although uh, in a sense they did have similar objectives. Both were seeking uh, a principle of equality, one by giving everybody the same course, uh, and the Scottish system by allowing individuals to create the curriculum which suited them. Um, I know that I favoured the Scottish approach. I know that I was proud of it, uh, then, even though I couldn't get him to understand it. And indeed, uh, later, uh, when I returned to teaching in a Scottish school, I was part of improving it further in personalisation when we introduced standard grade, which was very much a teacher-led uh, innovation at the time as well. So, so some of these principles, nobody is, is really arguing uh, with any of that, and Curriculum for Excellence is supposed to improve all of that. But, but you know, we've talked a bit about the evidence that the committee's already uh, received. And on Monday, uh, as I, I, I think um, well, uh, Jenny Go Ruth referred to, um, we did hold these focus groups with teachers and with parents in, uh, uh, in Dunfermline. Uh, and and I, it was a very striking focus group uh, with the teachers, around 10 teachers or so at a table with myself and Mr. Allen was there too. And I have to say that it was very clear those teachers did not feel as if they were in the lead in what's happening in their schools. They talked about, some of them, their subjects, being pushed out of the curriculum, yes, by the creation of more options for the young people in their schools, but by the narrowing of the number of choices they could actually make uh, from uh, that offer. They spoke particularly vociferously about um, the consequence which had happened of the three-year senior phase, which was more multi-level teaching. Now, earlier on today in um, education questions, I know the first, Deputy First Minister um, said that in his day at school, that there was multi-level teaching, and, and that's absolutely true. But I say to him, there is a big difference between uh, general and credit classes being taught together with the, the chance of uh, uh, young people moving between the two levels. And what is happening in schools now, which in many instances, according to these teachers, is four-level teaching with National 4, National 5, higher and advanced higher, all being taught at the same time in the same classroom in a class of up to 30 pupils. That is a very different animal altogether. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Mr Gray has generally, generously um, reduced my age significantly because I was not in the system when general and credit was going through the system. I predate that. But the point which I think has to also be reflected is the point that Mr Donnan made about the range of options that are now available, for example, for collaboration between schools in the delivery of a broader range of advanced higher opportunities for young people, where the number of young people in individual schools simply cannot justify the, uh, the creation of a specific course in an individual school. But the curriculum offer is still there for young people. Ian Gray. Well, as I say, uh, uh, this, this, this was the teacher's experience of what's happening uh, in their own schools. But the, the biggest difference, now I, I want to not lose the time for this, that they described was the differences in the curricular structure in their schools. And it was far more than just that some offered six, some seven, and some eight uh, uh, subjects at S4. The truth is that a number of those schools are actually still working to a two plus two plus two model. Most of them said that the pupils made their course choices at the end of S2, not at the end of S3 uh, at all. One described their curricular model as 2 plus 1, 2 plus 1. But what was clear was that these teachers did not feel they had had any part in the design of these structures. These were management-led uh, decisions which, uh, uh, to their view, constantly changed. 
and didn't leave them feeling empowered, but rather left them feeling embattled. They didn't feel any more empowered than the teachers that Jenny Manor spoke about in Dundee, uh, where the curricular structure is imposed from the centre across the local, local authority. Look, I accept that was a small group of evidence, but it was powerful evidence, and it does reflect other evidence the committee has heard. Earlier today, in uh, education questions, the Deputy First Minister, I think, tried to characterise concern about these issues as moral panic. Um, today, he has, this afternoon, he certainly characterised it as political opportunism. It is not. To hear these stories from our schools creates a moral and political imperative, not a panic, but an imperative, that we must listen, we must respond, we must do that in a serious way, and that's all the motion and the amendment asked this evening, and that's why they should be supported. I call on John Sweeney, the Cabinet Secretary, to wind up for the Government. Uh, President Officer, just to follow the, the point that Ian Gray's made there latterly, the, you know, the moral panic reference that I raised was a quote from Professor Mark Priestley, who's a very informed commentator who's been cited extensively in this debate and this question. And, and, I, and I cited Professor Priestley because I felt what it would help us to do is to come to the conclusion that we do need to consider this issue seriously. I've, I've indicated I'm perfectly willing to consider this particular issue, but I don't think we can do justice to it in an afternoon debate in the Scottish Parliament, and not particularly when the Scottish Parliament's Education Committee is involved in an area of evidence taking, which I think in the contributions that we've heard today covers disputed territory about what is the right way to proceed in this respect. And there's, a number, and there's a number of different areas of disputed evidence that I'm going to talk about in the course of my summing up. I think that... Uh, OK. Liz Smith. Notwithstanding that, Cabinet Secretary, do you acknowledge that in 2008, in 2013, in 2017 and in 2018, parliamentarians in this chamber have been on record about raising pretty serious concerns about this very issue? So there was broad political support around the design of curriculum for excellence and I also were reminded by Gordon MacDonald uh, in his uh, reporting or reading out of a BBC report from 2013 of the curricular model that is now being challenged here today which was a combination of particular subjects and a broader general education which I've been conscious to stress to Parliament has been deeper and more extensive, delivering more breath to young people within Scotland, was the model that was envisaged at the time of the creation of curriculum for excellence. So that's not a particularly surprising point. I think one of the issues which has emerged from this debate has been, but there's a, a few issues I'm going to touch on. The first is about the question of prescription from the centre or local discretion. And I think colleagues know that I'm very much on the side of local discretion. I found it odd that Graham Simpson talked through, almost attacked, the, the notion of local distinction in the schools of South Lanarkshire. He seemed to be criticising the fact that that exists. But if we have a system, would Mr Mundell just allow me to finish my point? If we are having a system which empowers schools, and that's very much what I want to do, and I thought that's what the Conservatives wanted to do, then we will have to be prepared to tolerate distinction and difference amongst individual schools, or we'll end up, maybe not quite in the model that Mr Gray talked about with the, of his Mozambique example, but we'll be edging closer towards the Mozambique example than the system of school empowerment and teacher agency, which I want to make sure is at the heart of our reforms. Of course, I'll give one. Oh, Mandel. Thank you uh, for, for giving way. Does the Cabinet Secretary not recognise that there's a difference between there being differences between s different schools because people have made a choice and a pattern that looks like there's a difference between different schools based on uh, parental income and on disadvantage? Is that not worrying? Cabinet Secretary. Well, that, that, it, that is worrying, and that's a point which my amendment seeks to acknowledge, that that is a worrying issue, and I want to explore that. It's part of the evidence that I'm concerned about, and, I, and, and I'm exploring that. But the issue... But the issue which I, I raise is that we have to, as a parliament, this is why we need a considered debate about these issues. We need to decide where we are sitting on the, which is why I want to wait for the education committee to report. We have to decide how far we are along the line of prescription 
or local discretion. Now, the accusation has been made that the curriculum has been narrowed. I don't think that is the case by design, because what we have seen is the creation of a broad general education that covers a more extensive part of the school experience for young people, where they have the opportunity to study subjects across eight curricular areas to a deeper level for a longer period than before. And then that's been coupled, and this will create timetabling challenges for schools, by an expansion of opportunities through school and college partnerships, the developing the young workforce agenda, which everybody in here supports, and also by the National Progression Awards, in which I go to schools and find schools explain to me that some of these initiatives are creating much better destinations for young people from backgrounds of deprivation than would ever be provided by the um, a range of opportunities in the traditional subjects. I'll give way to Mr Carson. Finney Carson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. The pupils and parents in, in Gallery and Western Fries would quite simply like to know whether a reduction in subject choice at S4 increases or decreases pupil choice at S5, S6 and further education and ultimately in their preferred career pathway. Cabinet Secretary. I don't think it affects it one bit because we're talking about a three-year senior phase where young people have the opportunity to select a number of subjects to ensure they've got good, strong lever qualifications, mm -hmm. which is what brings me on to the ultimate test, which is what are young people leaving our education system with? And on every measure, I think we have got reason to be confident in what our education system is achieving. We've seen, uh, and I was criticised earlier on for talking about the increase in hires achieved, but that is of note. Uh, we've seen the increase in vocational qualifications, uh, the number of pupils uh, leaving, uh, attaining, uh, number of school leavers attaining vocational qualifications at SCQF level five and above has increased from 7.3% to 14.8%. And we've seen also the uh, number of young people who are choosing to stay on at school longer, increasing very significantly uh, to ensure they have the opportunities to take part in that deeper learning. So in amongst all of this debate, uh, I think we've got to recognise that there are some significant issues that we have to decide upon. Do we want to leave it to educationalists to decide on these issues and these questions at local level? Is that where the priority should lie? Where educationalists are taking these decisions or is Parliament suddenly going to start prescribing these? Because that is, that is uh, an issue we need to be clear about because in my view, we should be empowering our schools to enable informed decisions to be taken. And I don't, and I don't understand uh, what the rationale would be for us to in some way prescribe that. I think we've got to recognise that, that in the foundations of Curriculum for Excellence, there would be a change to the way in which the education system operated and how it was perceived. And some of the comments that Gordon MacDonald made and some of the comments that John Mason made are comments that reflect the fact that we need to educate and inform the wider community about the outcomes that are achieved in our education system. That's what I'm committed to engaging about. We will do so when we hear the further in, uh, information that we receive from the Education Committee in due course, and the government will engage actively to make sure that we have an education system that meets the needs of young people and that delivers on the expectations of them and all of their families. Thank you, and I call on Murdo Fraser to wind up our debate. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Well, this has been a very helpful debate on the important subject of subject choice, and I'm grateful to all the members from across the chamber who have contributed to it. As a number of speakers have mentioned, this is an issue which has been highlighted in recent weeks, both in the report produced last week by Reform Scotland, headed the accidental attainment gap, and also in evidence to this Parliament's Education and Skills Committee over a number of weeks. And the first point to make is, what is absolutely clear from the evidence is that there is a problem we need to address. We've heard that from Professor Jim Scott of Dundee University, Keir Bloomer, one of the authors of the Curriculum for Excellence, Marina Shapira of Stirling University, Alan Britton at Glasgow University, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the parent organisation Connect, the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, the Scottish Association of Geography Teachers, and one in three schools who responded to the Education Committee survey. So I don't think it is credible simply to dismiss all this evidence and say there is no problem. 
And what was disappointing about much of this debate from the SNP benches, from their contributions, was that they seemed to be denying that there was any problem at all that needed to be addressed. And this prompted, of course, a well-deserved scolding from Joanne Lamont uh, of the, the Cabinet Secretary. And she was right to do so, because it, in looking at the evidence, there is a problem, and we should be debating it. What the Reform Scotland report told us is that where once most sta state schools would allow pupils to take seven or eight standard grades based on their individual ability, the majority of schools now offer only six subjects at S4, and in a few schools that's as low as five. And what's most concerning about these statistics, as Ross Greer very fairly said in his contribution, is that this impacts most on pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds. In the most deprived areas, just one in 10 schools offer 12 advanced hires or more. In the most affluent areas, seven out of 10 schools offer the same range of subjects. And there's also a contrast, I think Oliver Mundell made this point, between schools in urban areas and those in more rural uh, and remote communities. So why does this matter? There are a number of consequences from this reduction in student choice. It means that pupils are not being able to access the subjects that they want. A, a nationwide survey presented to this morning's meeting of the Education and Skills Committee revealed that 56%, 56% of youngsters in Scottish schools were denied the opportunity to study their chosen subjects from national four level onwards. The key subjects being denied were modern studies, French, history, human biology, and politics. And I've certainly had experience, and other members will too, of being contacted by the parents of pupils in my region, very concerned that their youngsters cannot access the courses they want to study. And that doesn't just knock the confidence of the pupil involved, it means they're unlikely to fulfill their potential, a point very powerfully made by Graham Simpson a few moments ago. One respondent to the survey said, and I quote, I wasn't allowed to take modern studies and another social subject, so I had to take art instead, which I hated. And another said, I was forced to take Spanish, a course I had no interest in, and miss a class I really enjoy. So pupils are being let down by the current approach, and the evidence tells us that. And there are also significant falls in the courses available that might have the greatest economic impact. The research shows that between 2013 and 2018, there was an overall decline of some 3,500 entrants in National 4 and 5 in the sciences, a decline of around 5,000 in social sciences, and an incredible decline in languages of 17,000. Now, I've sat through many debates in this chamber about the economy. I've, talk, I've sat through debates in the economy about exporting. We've all talked about the importance of exporting. This morning, the First Minister was launching a new initiative on exporting. And in every one of these debates, we talk about the importance of exporting and how we need to have pupils learning modern languages in our schools to help grow that export potential. And what do we see? A 17,000 drop in pupils studying modern languages. That is damaging our country's future economic potential. And presiding officer, what we see is a wide variation across Scotland, a postcode lottery, as Reform Scotland put it. Some local authorities, such as East Renfrewshire, allow children to sit eight or more exams. In other areas, such as Eastern Bartonshire or Dumfries and Galloway, we see uh, the decline, even over the past three years, in the number of courses uh, being offered, most schools offering only six. We see, as Alison Harris identified, this issue of multi-level teaching, teachers having to teach different year groups or levels at the same time. In his evidence to the Education and Skills Committee, William Hardy of the Royal Society of Edinburgh stated this is a particular problem when it comes to science. Professor Scott said it should be a no-no in science with this happening. So, presiding officer, what has gone wrong? Keir Bloomer puts the blame firmly on the interpretation of guidance in relation to curriculum for excellence. And he says this, one of the purposes of CFE was to broaden pupils' education, but instead the way in which it is being implemented is narrowing it significantly. There is ample opportunity for pupils to combine practical and academic options when they are unable to sit nine, eight, or even seven exams. But when we narrow it down to six or five, there is very little room for maneuver. Someone attending a school which allows only a low number of exams to be sat and who leaves after fourth year will find themselves with fewer qualifications than other leavers. Those going on to study hires 
have a smaller pool of subjects from which to choose. And this, he concludes, is the unintended consequence of ill-conceived advice. He states bluntly, this is the hallmark of poor management. And this answers the point that the, that the Cabinet Secretary uh, made uh, earlier in the debate and again recently. Because, of course, schools should have autonomy. But the problem is, at the moment, the schools are struggling with the interpretation of the curriculum and the information being passed down to them, which is not sufficiently clear. And Jenny Mara made an important point, too, that often... Uh, let me just make this last point and I'll go away. Jenny Mara made an important point that often it's councils who will determine the number of subjects, so the schools themselves have no autonomy. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would agree that's an unsatisfactory situation. Cabinet Secretary. I wonder if, Murdo, I'm grateful to, to Murdo Fraser for giving way, I wonder if he would share with Parliament <coughs> what areas of the curricular guidance should be improved to assist schools in the del delivery of that uh, ch uh, subject choice that he's talking about. Murdo Fraser. Th thank the Cabinet Secretary for that interest. That is precisely where, where we are calling for this mid-term review for Curriculum for Excellence to be brought forward so we can study particularly what needs to be improved. That is what, precisely what Keir Hardy has been calling for and the Cabinet Secretary should be listening. Keir Hardy. Yeah, Keir Hardy, somebody else altogether. Keir, Keir Bloom, our presiding officer. That's what he's been calling for. And these, these concerns of Keir uh, Bloomer were echoed by William Hardy from the Royal Society of Edinburgh, giving evidence to the Education and Skills Committee last week. And he referred to Education Scotland issuing new guidance in 2016 on how the broad general education and senior phases knit together. And he said, and again it's a quote, even the new guidance is unclear about the extent to which learning in a broad general education phase can prepare young learners for progression to national qualifications. So when even one of the architects of Curriculum for Excellence says there is a problem with the way it's being interpreted, when we see clear problems with the guidance being issued, it is time the Scottish Government paid attention. Because this matters. It matters to parents, it matters to pupils, and it matters to our economy. In evidence to the committee, one parent, Alice Rodwell, said her concern was that there would be a knock-on effect on the success and employability of young people in the country for years to come. She said this, unless there are changes, the standing of the Scottish education system will continue to fall in comparison with the rest of the world. And Professor Jim Scott put it bluntly when he said, we are in danger of a whole generation going past who have not had a good experience in education. So, presiding officer, what is to be done? It is time the Scottish Government took the advice of experts and carried out the delayed mid-session review of curriculum for excellence. That is what Professor Scott uh, recommended, for quite simply, what we have at the moment is not fit for purpose, and if we continue with it, too many of our young people will lose out. And that precisely is the point covered in Ian Gray's amendment uh, this afternoon, uh, calling for this evaluation uh, to be uh, brought forward. And I'm glad the Scottish Government have accepted uh, that point, and will support that amendment as we will, because that is precisely what we need to be doing. But to close, uh, presiding officer, I don't think we accept the call we heard from Mr Swinney at the very start, the, the claim from Mr. from Mr Swinney that this issue should be punted into the long grass. We shouldn't be debating it now, is what he said. Because this is not a new issue. We've been talking about this issue for years. I think this Parliament cannot debate issues like this, issues that matter to parents and pupils and teachers across Scotland. What is this Parliament for? What is the point of it? And I thought it was very unwise. I thought it was very unwise for Mr Swinney to say at the start of the debate that this was, a, this was a debate about political opportunism. He had a more emollient term. He had a more emollient term towards the end. But frankly, this parliament needs to be about highlighting the real concerns of people in education. And that is precisely what we've been doing this afternoon. And what we've seen in this debate is all the opposition parties coming together, raising their concerns from different political perspectives on the route we are currently going down. I sincerely hope the Scottish Government will listen to Parliament should this motion be passed at decision time with a Labour amendment. I hope they'll stop burying their heads in the sand and start agreeing to take action because that is what Scotland's pupils deserve. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on subject choice. The next item is consideration of business motion 17114 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graeme Day to move the motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And if no one wishes to speak on the motion, the question is that motion 17114 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of business motion 17115 in the name of Graeme Day 
on behalf of the Bureau on stage on the stage two timetable for a bill. And uh, could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. And if no one wishes to speak on the motion, the question is that motion 17115 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 17116 on approval of an SSI. And could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move this motion? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. We come now to decision time. <clears throat> First question is that Amendment 17091.4 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend Motion 17091. Ah, yes. There's a preemption first. Just if this uh, amendment is agreed, then the amendment to the name of Ian Gray will fall. So the question is that Amendment 17091.4 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend Motion 17091 in the name of Liz Smith on subject choice, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17091.4 in the name of John Swinney is yes, 62, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is not agreed. The next question is that amendment 17091.2 in the name of Ian Gray, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Liz Smith on subject choice, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 17091 in the name of Liz Smith, as amended on subject choice, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17091 in the name of Liz Smith, as amended, is yes, 64. There were no votes against. There were 61 abstentions. The motion, as amended, is therefore agreed. The final, the final question is that motion 17116 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, and that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Fulton McGregor on Give Them Time. Before we do so, we'll just take a few moments for members and the minister to change seats. Just a few moments.